Welcome to the Waves of Change podcast, where we aim to inspire the listener to awaken to their purpose and take the action required to live life on their own terms. My name is Dara Bourne, confidence and mindset coach, speaker, entrepreneur and humanitarian. I will be sitting down with creators from all walks of life who grew through the waves of change in their lives to be making the impact in the world they are today. Rebecca Radani, thank you very much for coming on to the show. Rebecca is a clinical psychologist and someone, a dear friend, and we shared the space together last year in Elementum Master Coach Training, which pushed us to our absolute limits and beyond. Rebecca, it's been an absolute pleasure to walk alongside you, to walk alongside you, and to learn from you. Thank you for coming on as a guest today. How are you right now? I am so good. I'm so pumped to be here with you, Dara. It's so lovely to connect again after the extreme year that we had last (laughs) year. So it's lovely to be in this space with you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. So, Rebecca, just to start out, if you want to give us a little rundown um, what your background is, first of all, like from your childhood regards. Um, where did you grow up? What was life, life like growing up? And mm-hmm. yeah, all of those touch points. Amazing. You know, I mean, I could take up the whole podcast uh, hour <laughs> just telling my backstory, but I, I won't. I'll keep it sort of short and sweet. Um, I wasn't born in Australia, so I came here when I was seven years old, spoke no English whatsoever. Um, so I had to learn how to speak English, which was a bit of a challenge in and of itself. I spoke four languages before that. I was born in Europe and then travelled around a little bit because my parents aren't the same nationality. So my dad is Middle Eastern and my mum is Eastern European, which means I was born in Eastern Europe and then we travelled to Middle East for a Mm -hmm. while. Um, We were there while the war broke out. So this was in the early 80s. And so we stayed there for a couple of years, kind of um, trying to navigate our lives around the war. Uh, Mm -hmm. But my dad didn't feel like it was the safest place for us to be. So we migrated to Germany. uh, And then after a couple of years there, we decided to come to Australia because my dad loved the sun. uh, (laughs) He went to work um, on the Sydney Harbour. So his dream came true and we all came along with him for the ride. So here we are. Wow, that's incredible. That's absolutely incredible. Like that's a fucking full story in itself. I yes. can see where you could compartmentalize and take most of the podcast over that story. But just quickly before we touch on, can you yes. give me those countries a name? Um, yes. Yeah. In okay. order. Yeah. Yes. So Romania. Okay. Lebanon. Okay. And then I had a stint because my dad used to drive massive cargo boats. So I had a stint of about a year living on the boat um, okay. and traveling with him to different countries. With my mum, obviously. Um, and then we went to Germany. Yes. And yes. then we came to Australia when I was seven. Wow. So that's a lot. And you spoke four different languages before I you even got to Australia. Four different languages, yeah. Keep yeah. it coming. Talk to me. <laughs> what languages? I want to know more. So Romanian, um, Arabic. And when I was in Lebanon, you know, they start you off at school there when you're three years old, very, very stringent Whoa. education system, and they Whoa. start you learning a language straight away. So I could also speak French. Wow. And then when I came to Germany, I learned how to speak German uh, and then came to Australia and didn't know anything but could speak all of these other languages which <laughs> none of my peers could speak. Uh, and my parents both knew English, so they started speaking to me in English, and I lost the German. Oh, so I don't well. Speak, yeah, I don't speak any German. I do the other three languages, but not German, unfortunately. Wow, that's incredible. By the age of seven, you were already well ahead of the game across the board. <laughs> but, like, to go to Lebanon and they teach you French, you can still speak French? I can still speak French because I retook it again in high school and in uni. I love the French language and I love France. So I wanted to be able to hold on to that language when I travelled back there. And I have been back there a couple of times. Wow. I'm after becoming good friends with some French people. And the lady who owns um, the, the venue, the villas, the whole 
area where we're getting married. They're French. That mm-hmm. they're um, yeah, it's good. It's good fun. Um, yes. we we what was it? There was a football tournament going to Ireland. I came to the World Cup years ago on Thierry Henry. You know football. Yes. Soccer, yeah. probably to you. Yeah. You know who Thierry Henry is? No. Yeah, what do they call it? The hand of frog. Because uh-huh. it was Ireland were winning. Can't remember whether they were winning or drawing, but whatever they were at, they were they had the result they needed to go to the World Cup. Mm-hmm. And at, like there was five or maybe ten minutes left in the match and Thierry Henry, there was a chance and he handballed it and pulled it back and put it pull it across the goal and, and they scored, which meant they went to the World Cup and Ireland didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, in Europe, a lot of people call French people frogs. I don't, I don't know where that comes from. But uh, yeah, the hand of frog instead of the hand of God, Diego Maradona yeah, against England. Yeah. But anyways, coming back and my love for baguettes and, and French people are a bit cracked. Uh, the guy from uh, CrossFit and good friends of now. But um, learning to speak French in a Lebanese school at the age of was it three years of age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, did you have a choice or was that what you were no, given? No, because, you know, many, many years ago, Lebanon was colonised by the French. And if you speak to the older Lebanese generation, they will tell you that um, Lebanon was actually considered the Paris of the Middle East. Whoa. In the 60s and early 70s, you know, I've seen photos of it then and it's beautiful. The buildings yeah. are stunning like Europe and you know, just beautiful promenade walks and absolutely amazing country. And the beauty about Lebanon is you've got the mountains and the sea within an hour of each other. So when I visited, it hasn't been uncommon for me to look up at the mountains and to see the snow and to also have a swim in the ocean on the exact same day. Wow. And what was the heat? Like what's the air temperature down at the beach? Pretty warm. Pretty warm. Oh, you know, you're looking crazy. at late twenties, early thirties, right? But still snow capped mountains. So it's such a um a land of contrasts. Mm. I seen a photo I used to work for Lebanese when I lived in Sydney. I I worked for it, like I love them to be honest. Because yeah. it, it's like uh people a lot of people don't trust them, I can see why. But you know, uh, where I come from in Ireland, it's it's similar, you know. So it's like that's why I get on with them so well. Yeah. <laughs> they were stringent and and super strict, and they just wanted the yeah. job done. And there was a bit of flexibility yeah. in that, and yeah. they wanted hard work, of course. Yes. But um, yeah. it was always eventful working with them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're such hard workers, and they're such a party race. You know, they've had to endure so much. There's such a huge sense of resilience behind them. Um, They don't just take things at face value. They will really fight for what it is that they believe in. And family is so important for them, as is hospitality and culture. So it's interesting because, you know, in Sydney, um, as maybe you're aware, but there's a huge Lebanese population here. And it's almost as if they've brought their culture here with them in certain areas, right? It really feels like mini Lebanon here. Uh Uh-huh. Um and yeah, coming back to the fight, you know, there was uh I've had many of fights with them on site. Like with my yeah. boss. Not never never got to a physical <laughs> but you know that it's the artist um not stubbornness but not back down. And yes. Time when they start to shout yes. and try to overpower through their size and masculinity and power yeah. and, and then you meet them in that, it's like it's just it's just fireworks, you know. It's like yeah. fuck you. You're yeah. not going to speak to me like that, you know. And <laughs> yeah. it, there's been very, there's been a few eventful uh, heated moments, that's for yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah, they're definitely hot blooded. You know, the Mediterraneans generally tend to be quite hot blooded in in that yeah. area. Mm. And the field, the field with the culture is incredible. Amazing, <clears throat> amazing. Yeah, I had the um, privilege of growing up with my grandma. And it would be amazing me seeing her work on a meal for a couple of days. Oh wow! You know, it would be a real communal thing where the women would all get together and sit on a rug on the floor and start to wrap the little vine leaves and make the sauce and make the ravioli from scratch. You know, delicious meals. 
but very time intensive. You know, you can understand maybe why these days that has been lost a little bit along the way. Yes, because everyone's in a hurry. And I see what I'm saying that. My mouth is watering right now. <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't help Saoirse, Saoirse and my partner, being yeah. okay, soon to be wife. Um, she, she preps food like that and it drives me mad. <laughs> I, I just want my stuff done so I can move on to the next thing. And she, even like all the way from the prep, all the way down to eating it, she <laughs> like every, every single thing on the dish gets a plate or gets a place on the fork and then you get the condiments and she gets a little bit of this. So she's decorating each mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> so there's probably five minutes in between the time she gets starts putting it on the fork to the time she finishes and then she decorates it with the condiments and then she'll eat it on just like <laughs> feed me feed me what a beautiful way to be mindful though Dara right you know she's really essentially enjoying the experience like she's in it oh fully in it. and you know what when we were home in in, in summer there it was just before we I'd finished up in your um in our trio group but her mother, you know the way we say the family tree. We were sitting for lunch in 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 in, in our mother's house, and oh, I mean, from start to finish, they fucking carbon copy of each other. I was like, now it all makes sense. It all makes fucking sense. No fault. <laughs> uh... But anyways, Rebecca, coming back to yourself, um. What was it like as a young child um, growing up in a war zone? Yeah, look, I'll be honest with you, Dara. I don't remember a lot from my childhood. And I guess, you know, the older I've gotten, the more I throw myself into this work of self-development, the more I learn about psychology and about how the brain works. I'm not surprised that I don't have a lot of memories simply because, you know, when we're that fearful, our brain can't store things correctly, right? Okay. Um, but what I do know is my body definitely keeps score of those memories. So um, it was tough. You know, my my grandma, my mum will tell me stories of me screaming, screaming mm -hmm. whenever the bombs were going off. Um, there's a famous family story of, you know, we used to live in front of the ocean in a, in a multi-story building, almost like an apartment block, you call them. Uh -huh. We were quite high, maybe on the seventh or tenth floor. Uh -huh. um, and there's a story of, you know, a missile being released and um you know everyone preparing for the for the explosion and the explosion didn't happen and everyone was wondering what where's the missile where did it go what had happened was our neighbor above us it had lodged on top of his head in the bed and it didn't go off so just stories like that you know it's it's our family is filled with things like that um wow the, the the adults, you know, I can't even imagine what it would have been like to be an adult there to try and comfort the children while also trying to regulate your own nervous system. Mm. Um, it was hard. But one of the things that I'm so grateful for, you know, my dad's one of ten. Uh -huh. So he had <laughs> lots of siblings and at that time any of them kind of weren't married or if they were, there were only one or two married. So we were all living in very close quarters. And so I had lots of cousins playing yeah. around yeah. And I feel like having that community really buffered things, Dara, because, you know, I I didn't necessarily grow up with this idea that the world is a dangerous place, even though it was, because I had the safety of the community there to buffer all of that. Um, and even now, like I was in the city yesterday and I was telling mm. my mum, I, like, oh, I love crowds, I just love being here and I love like looking at everyone. And I think it's because I grew up that way. I grew up with uh -huh. like 50 cousins <clears> around <throat> And people coming in and out, and lots of aunties and uncles, and it was just fun. The Lebanese mm -hmm. culture was very community oriented, um, and you know we didn't have devices back then, right? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So there was a lot of connection, and I think that really helped to counteract some of the tough times of you know being in shelters so that we wouldn't get bombed, running away to different areas of Lebanon, like in the mountains where they weren't. We weren't as much of a target as we were on the ocean front, hiding in churches and buildings. Like it's I think it really counteracted a lot of the tough times. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. If I didn't have that, I probably would have 
being a very different person. Oh wow! Like that's incredible. My heart is exploding right now. That's that's a right. powerful, powerful story. Yeah. So, two things. What I'm hearing is, uh, you you had a bigger community, so you could move to different areas, yes. and that like moving around into different areas of nature was almost like an adventure for you. Yeah. And that that's yeah. what kept you grounded. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And. Why was it the ocean front that was targeted most? Um, because <laughs> so now this is where things get a little bit sketchy because my history isn't up to scratch. So please forgive me if I'm going to um, <laughs> get the countries wrong. But I think what had happened was at that time it was Israel who were sending missiles from across the ocean, uh-huh. and because we were ocean front, we were targeted. So they would send them straight across the ocean to the land and. Oh, the high buildings near the coast um, were the ones who were in the way, <laughs> so to speak. You know, Lebanon is built up a bit more like Rio de Janeiro, not so much as we have here in Sydney or maybe as what, well, I, I don't know, I haven't been in Bali, but in Sydney, if you remember, you know, places like Bondi and the eastern suburbs. The, 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 the huge ocean yeah, front, yeah. Yeah, lots of houses, lots of kind of yeah. mountains. Um, Lebanon's very built up. You don't tend to have many of the on land kind of grounded housing you have that in the mountains but definitely closer to the coastline it's all high-rise apartments mm. it's crazy because i've seen well it's not crazy it's uh i've seen some of them photos you see them floating around on instagram and um, you know before the americans brought in uh, the foreign policy and after you know yes. and, and and these countries were absolutely like breathtakingly beautiful um and even even like the guys that i worked with when they were sending back videos of you know i'll look at it because i was in work and they're sending me videos so i'd say fuck you because i I was their boss (laughs) 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 i was their boss and we used to have to crack you know (laughs) sending back videos when they're in these uh, beach clubs and Mm -hmm. i was i couldn't believe it because because that's all I associated, well, that's what we're programmed to associate with is on the yeah. news, um, yeah. Lebanon's a war zone. Um, I can't remember, we had a saying in, in Ireland, um, but that, that was what it referenced, like yeah. a reference. It was like when we were slagging each other or whatever, saying, oh, come on back to Lebanon. I can't, I can't remember exactly what it was, but that was the connotation of it. The Lebanon mm-hmm. is a war zone. Yeah. Um, but to see how much beauty is there too, yes, it's, it's like it's the truth that they don't tell you on the television. Yes, unless you know people. So thank yeah. you for sharing that with mm-hmm. And not just the beauty of the country, but the beauty and the spirit of the people, Dara. The people, yeah, yeah, the resilient. Because mm-hmm. there was a big, massive explosion there, maybe two years ago. Was that right? Three yeah. years ago. In the port. In of Beirut. the port. Yeah. Beirut. That's right. Did they ever? I've got my own reservations about that. I don't believe the story of Estella. Um, yeah. But h- how much damage did that do and have they managed to recover from it? Yeah, look, um, they have to a degree, and I think Lebanon is one of those countries that um, no matter how much people try to sort of snuff out the spirit of the people and destroy the country, they will always come back to some degree or another. Mm-hmm. It may take them a little while, but they will always come back. Um, so that they they definitely have rebuilt Beirut. I don't know if it was it's the same as what it was before, but um, the the resilience of the Lebanese people is strong, and they're not a a, a people to really give up very easily. So no. if they set something to their mind, if they want to rebuild Beirut to how it was, I have no doubt that that's exactly mm-hmm. what will achieve. Mm-hmm. 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 Do you still have family there? I do, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got yeah. um most of my aunties are there, so I've got three, four aunties still there, yeah. um, and two or three uncles still there, and lots of cousins. Oh gosh, the, yeah. the, the tree. Yeah. What what's it called? The tree, and then the leaves, and then it just yes, just <laughs> multiplies like a plant behind you. It just multiplies. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so you moved to Australia to transition. Uh, you yeah. came without the language um, yeah. as a 
foreigner, if you will. Yeah. Uh, um, what was that like? What was the transition for you and your family? What do mm. you remember most? Hmm. You know, we, we hmm, where to start here? It was interesting because um, part of these stories are um, influenced by what my parents say, um, particularly my mum. She's got some very powerful stories. Um, she really liked Germany. I don't know if you've ever had a chance to visit Germany, but um, very, very advanced, very clean, very organised. Um, everything gets done on time. And so to come from that to Australia where everything's yeah. like, I should be right, mate. <laughs> I think it was such a shock to my parents who are used <laughs> to structure and order and timeliness and um, a certain way that things are done and technology. And, you know, we landed and I remember my mum telling me story of she got out of the airport and she looked at the bag baggage carousel and it was wooden. And she just started thinking like, where have we come? What have we gotten ourselves into? The because carousel was wooden. Yes, yes, the wow. baggage carousel back then. So Germany didn't have that. Obviously, they had metal. Wow. You know, all of their telephones ah. were under underneath. The transport system was excellent. They had bullet trains and all sorts of things. Um, so I think it was definitely an adjustment period. My parents probably had an easier time than us simply because they spoke the language. Okay. They were English they both of them had studied at school was mandatory um my dad had been traveling the seas for a while so he spoke English very, very well mm -hmm. um it was a bit more challenging for me I got stuck in ESL and had to learn English that way so English is a second language those classes what's ESL language. yeah so English is a second language it's oh, classes for children who don't good. speak English okay we had to go there to learn how to speak English. Okay, wow. So it was hard communicating with my peers and trying to make connections because I just didn't speak what they spoke. Uh-huh. We were lucky in a way, though, because we, we came here and my dad has lots of relatives here, um, so I could speak Arabic to other kids, which uh -huh. was great. Mm -hmm. um, but to anyone outside of our community, I was a little bit stuck. But it didn't take me too long to learn English. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, and I think one of the things we really loved about Australia was just the nature. Mm. Um, my dad treated it as a bit of an adventure. So way That's back it. then, you know, we'd go to things like the city and it was really an adventure. You could still park in the middle of the city. There weren't that many people back then. And we'd go to the botanical gardens and just spend days there. And my dad would take his video camera and <laughs> like a real tourist. <laughs> Look at Asian. Running around doing exactly that. And back then, you know, the video cameras were big. <laughs> <laughs> Get the reverse in on the truck. Yeah. So it, it, it was good. I feel like we didn't, the transition was good simply because my parents made it so. Yeah, it's amazing. What year was, what years were they? 1988. Wow. We I was three. January. I was yeah. three. January uh, 88. I wasn't even three. I was two and a half. Yeah. Uh, August. I was born in <laughs> August. That's incredible though. And, and oh my God, Australia's nature. I love it. Yeah. I love it. I, I got to see more of it when I took up surfing. Because yeah, you obviously I was looking for waves and, and new places to get waves with less crowds, so yeah. it's breathtaking, like fuck me. Stunning, isn't um, it? Yeah, yeah. Just just um the transition as well, you know, you said the dad uh, spent a lot of time on the sea. Um what was that like for you with oh sorry, how many brothers and sisters do you have? So two younger sisters. Two younger sisters. So yeah. as a family with your dad and um, walking on the seas, what was that like? Yes. Around yeah, look, it, it was hard. Um, and, and I felt that mainly in Lebanon because, you know, he'd be away for months at a time. Mm -hmm. um, and it was hard. But, again, I think, Dara, you know, I probably didn't feel it as much simply because I had so many other people, you know, mm -hmm. to, to play with, right? So he yeah. absolutely felt as strongly. Um but I think I had a very strong connection with him because interestingly enough, you know, I could see the ocean and I could see all the boats and, um, you know, the cargo boats aren't, aren't small. They're quite big and they're very visible. 
Um, and my grandma told me stories of, you know, the day before my dad would arrive into port, what I would say is I'd look out and I'd say, oh, dad's boat is coming in. And so everyone would go outside and they'd look and they'd look, you know, binoculars and they couldn't see anything out there, Whoa. right? But always, always he would come into port the next day. Wow. Um, so there was a strong connection there, yes. even though he was away for months at a time. That is amazing, like the human spirit and intuition. Yeah. Intuition, like, and again, back then, you're not getting a text message to say, oh, I'm on my way <laughs> back. I'll see you in a few uh, days. Nothing. Nothing. Blind and blind, isn't it? Yep. Fingers yeah. crossed that he comes back and the boat hasn't yeah. drowned, you know. Exactly, yeah. yes, because yeah. you, you just yeah. don't know, do you? Yeah. Um, yeah. What oceans are there really quick um, around Lebanon? What oceans is it? The, the Mediterranean, the Mediterranean. Um, is, is the immediate ocean around there. Yeah, but my dad, you know, sailed um, in the Bosphorus Sea, would go up to Russia, would, um, I think, went to right. Ireland once. Okay. Um, I think has been to South America, he had lots of stories around Colombia. Um, so everywhere, you know, like when it comes to cargo, you're not really restricted with the boats yeah. and where it goes. So he'd he'd be travelling everywhere. Wow, that's incredible. Um, mm -hmm. you also mentioned as well, you know, there's this thing that's sort of seen online that you know, racism and hatred and all of those things I learned. Um, because mm -hmm. when kids are kids, they're just kids. Um, yeah. with the language barrier, uh, did you feel? Like you, I know you, you found it hard communicating like language was, but did you feel that there was you were able to play with kids that didn't speak your language? Did you notice that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, look, I definitely I think so, Dara, and that probably comes generally tend to make friends quite easily, right? Oops. You know, kids will just sort of start to play with each other. So when it comes to playing and having fun, I think for children that transcends language. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yes, definitely, definitely. Yeah. So for anyone listening yeah. to going to different countries, here's our invitation. Don't wait, just jump. That's it. That's <laughs> it, yeah. Kids will yeah. figure it out. Yeah. So growing up for you then, Rebecca, um, like beyond those years, Mm -hmm. Next next part of your life in Australia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, look, um, I guess one of the big things that happened for me was I started working at McDonald's when I was 14 and stayed there probably for five and a half years. So that really took me through high school and early university years. And Dara, I can't tell you how much fun I had just being in a massive group of guys and girls, um, partying every weekend almost. No way. 7 a.m. Macca's runs, you know, it was just so much fun. I really, really, really loved my time in Australia. Um, I worked hard at uh -huh. school and at uni to kind of get to where it is that I wanted to be. Um, but I also had fun in the process. So I don't really look back with any regrets because I kind of lived my life in the moment as I would want to have lived it. Yeah. Um, I've got nieces and nephews, you know, one of them, it's almost like, I don't know if you call it family legend, but everyone loves to remind me about those times. Even my mum gets <laughs> like, oh, Rebecca, do you remember those McDonald's runs? I mean, what is it about night clubbing that then everyone needs to go to the McDonald's to? <laughs> <All right home. laughs> um, and my, my niece is like, Auntie Becca, she calls me Auntie, Auntie Becca, why was it the naughty one? <laughs> ah, yes. And why are you still the naughty one? <laughs> what? Right time there, which I think really balanced out. Um, Hold so, on, let's yes. let's let's put put the handbrake up there. <laughs> what was your answer to your niece's question? <laughs> why am I still the naughty one? I've changed. I've matured now. <laughs> but why Although were I still you love a good dad. One. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Hmm. So, yeah, transitioning those years, like uh, McDonald's, then uh, uni and so on, what, what came after? Yes. All those parties. Yeah, all the, after all those parties. Well, then came the real world, didn't it? 
starting <laughs> to work. Um, interestingly enough, though, you know, I didn't, I, I mean, I kind of knew what I wanted to do when I finished high school. I was really, really good at art and I loved it and I wanted to do fashion design. But I didn't get the mask. We've got like a, like a, um, uh, a scoring system, I suppose, here that tells you, okay, if you get this mark, then you can go on to do this. Right? I don't know how it works in other countries, but that's how. Yeah, it I, th- I think it's the same. Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't quite get the marks to do um, design, which was so sad. Um, and then I also wanted to do psychology and IT. IT because I was good at it. And back then, you know, this was like as the Y2K was approaching. So everyone was saying, you know, there's so much money in there, go in there. Mm-hmm. Um, and psychology, just because I loved it, I was always interested in it. Um and one of the things that I do look back and think, oh, I wish someone had told me something differently is to really follow your dreams and not be deterred because I chose, oh. I didn't chose psycho- I didn't choose psychology because it was too long. It was a six-year degree compared to IT, which was a three-year degree. And so I chose IT because it was shorter and because it was at Sydney University and I loved the buildings there. So when I look back, the one thing I probably would have told my younger self is it doesn't matter how long a degree is and the buildings, it doesn't matter how beautiful they are. If you want to do something, don't procrastinate. Yes. Like I'm I'm kind of glad that I did it because, you know, I did IT first, so I ended up in computer science, which means I can Uh fix my computers, you know, I I know all about systems, um, blah, blah, blah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I love in, it. <laughs> right? So I ended up working as the project manager um, in the end for IT companies, which, again, was a great, beautiful experience. But I made the transition to psychology because it wasn't where my heart was. No. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I'd just wake up every day and there'd be this niggling. I don't know if I'd call it dread, Dara, but it kind of had that flavour it was almost as if my my soul was consistently tapping me on the shoulder going, uh, 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 we've taken the wrong turn, honey, and <laughs> it's a U-turn. And I'm not sure how many more things I can send you to tell you that you need to U-turn, but I'm going to start to get louder and louder if you don't listen. Wow, Rebecca, that's an incredible story. Uh, the waves have changed. I don't know how much you know about my podcast. This yeah. is what it's about. Um, yeah. Instead of fearing the change, and this is, oh, but if, if I only know data, science, and whatever yeah. it is we're working at, uh, what do we do now? Do we start again? And yeah. um, what would you say to, and again, just coming back to that statement you said, to follow your dreams instead of being deterred by others. Yes. So for people who are listening to this, who are feeling that calling to, perhaps go back and start an apprenticeship or start at the bottom rung of whatever career it is that they that their soul desires. What would you say to them? Mm-hmm. I'm going to take a leaf out of Nike, Nike here and just say, just do it, Dara. Because, <laughs> you know, if you think, if, if you fast forward to your 80th birthday, are you going to want to look back and say, oh, I wish I did that? you know, or are you going to be really living into your soul alignment? Because I've had both. I've had uh-huh. the experience of not living with my soul alignment and living with it. And I tell you, the journey wasn't easy. The transition was really tough at some points. But I love my career. I don't even think about it as a career. I think about it as a calling. Mm-hmm. Right? And I really feel like I'm on purpose. There might be some changes and shifts and tweaks here and there, and I feel like I'm in that phase at the moment. Uh-huh. But um, I don't regret the change, not for one minute, just because the sense of fulfillment is so pervasive and there's that sense of peace. I no longer have that tap on my shoulder. Wow. And that's massive, Sarah. That's huge, man. That's huge because a lot of people are lost in today's world because they're doing things that they hate for a living or they're selling their time for money. Um, yeah. But that's huge, like absolutely huge. Um, where do we even start here? Um, what did it feel like for you starting again? Tell us about that. Yeah. Um, it was hard. 
on a couple of for a couple of reasons, Sarah, because um, I you know I was living outside of home, and so I had um bills and things to keep up, and so I made the decision to go back and restudy part time, simply because I needed to keep working. Uh huh. And working full time and studying part time was really, really challenging because I didn't necessarily have a lot more energy for anything else. Mm-hmm. That started to shift later on when I started to to think about okay, there must be another way to do this. I went part time with work and part time uni, and that felt like a better balance for me. Uh huh. Right? But the other struggle was, you know, I was one of the oldest um, students in my class. Because everyone had been kind of finished high school, went straight into psychology, uh-huh. right? Whereas I came in as a mature age student. <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> Mind yeah. you, I think I was like 22 maybe at that time, but I was still mature age. <laughs> oh, wow. Look at that. <laughs> so um, that had its own challenges simply because I was also at different stages of life than uh-huh. my peers. You know, I'd been in the corporate world for a while. Um, I'd been a manager for a while. And so um, there was a little bit of that that prevented that um, complete connection that uh-huh. I might have had if I'd come straight out of high school. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things I also found quite challenging was at, at some points I kind of was really clear that I wanted to be a clinical psychologist and have my own practice. Mm-hmm. But it seemed like such a long road ahead, Dara, that at times that I felt really discouraged uh-huh. because studying part-time, it was, you know, something like I knew it would be 10 years in the making. Mm. And so really having people around me that can support me and just encourage me and almost stoke that motivation fire when I felt like it was really going out was super helpful. Wow. That's super powerful. Helpful. That's really, really powerful. So is is that what it took you in the in the long run? Yeah, yeah. I think years. even longer than that. Yeah, because wow. I had to go back and do like introductory psychology subjects, um, and then you have to do an honors subject, which is pretty much you can't be working during that because it's so intensive, right? And so, although I knew what it is that I wanted to do in the end, I had this goal, I had this vision. Um, that was quite flexible just in the manner of I needed to check in with myself at certain milestones throughout the study process and kind of go, okay, is this still my vision? Is this still my sole purpose? Am I still aligned with where I want to be going? And if so, what's the next step I need to take? And so at one point I quit my job, mm-hmm. moved back in with my parents mm-hmm. and did honours. Wow. So that's what it took, right? <clears throat> Mm-hmm. Um, so so now like it's uh, what age were you when you completed oh so I finished everything in 2015 2015 so in my 30s yeah in your 30s so yeah. what seven years ago so what roughly mid uh, early 30s mid mid 30s 30 34, I think. 34. Yeah. Okay. So where I'm coming at now is they say it takes 10 years to become an overnight success um, and 10,000 hours as well. Um, for you then to be in alignment with your soul's purpose in the career that you love, was the 10 years worth it? Yes. Absolutely, Dara. Absolutely. And, you know, when I have clients that come to me with the exact same challenge, um, I feel for them. I feel for them because I know what it's like to be out of alignment and it's horrible. Mm -hmm. It's almost like, you know, I wouldn't wish that fate on anyone. Mm -hmm. It Mm -hmm. doesn't feel good. It's almost like this itch that you just cannot scratch. Um, so really my 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 advice is anything that you can do to get yourself to where it is you want to be, do it. Mm-hmm. Because you think that it takes a really, really, really long time. But Dara, how many how many of us have had like three years go by like that? Just 
just right now, it's, it's I just looked at the the fucking date here. It's twenty seventh of January already. Yeah. In my yeah. mind, it's still March in twenty twenty two. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like what the fuck just happened? Even, even when I was writing for my masters, my master project, it was like, wow. Yeah. As I wrote what had happened, I was like, how how did that even happen? Like what exactly the fuck happened? Exactly. Um, Exactly. And, and even coming to you, like, just sorry to, to cut you off, but mirror and yeah. back. For me, I was in construction. I was working as a plumber, and I was looking after teams of people on two different job sites at one stage. Um, running all over the shop. I didn't have a watch with the, the, the numbers, you know, all the number yeah. stuff. But I always knew. Mm. See, see the way you knew that it was psychology? Mm. I, I knew it was something. I, mm. I just knew, because... We deal with the stormwater, who's the first person that they call is the plumber. Why the fuck is the water coming into my building? Why the <laughs> fuck is the... Do you know what I mean? These buildings are like 12, 15 stories high. So I'm responsible for organising the team to get the water and the rain and you're looking at the storms and fuck, we're getting record storms these next weeks. We need to have this sorted. And then when, you know, but I always knew... Um, that this wasn't going to be my life forever. But mm-hmm. I didn't know what that was. Ah. Like, mm-hmm. I went I went to, to uh, Preston and Alexis, the bridge, you're gone. Mm-hmm. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not sure I, if I should be scared or excited. <laughs> <laughs> you should be both, I'd say, easily. He's one eye cheek, like, right on the border. Like, <laughs> um, but I went to that because I had the... Uh, trust issues in my relationship mm. um, and I loved Alexi and I, I started to learn from her in 2015 that was when 2012 I think 2010 was the first time I, I read The Secret but okay. I started to learn more as the years went on and then, I, then I found Alexi and then in, in 2015 in the documentary and I was learning more about psychology and spirituality and the universe and nature. But I was still in construction and I'd never, like, there was no click. There was never a click. Mm-hmm. And I seen Alexi was in Australia uh, with, with her new husband, Preston. So mm-hmm. I was like, oh, and I was having all these issues with my relationship with trust. And I had this anxiety whenever Cersei went for a drink with the girls even if she was only downstairs and um, I go up to bed tired ready for construction you're getting up at half five six a.m but as soon as I, my head hit the pillow this this anxiety and I, I never had I was never anxious in my life mm-hmm. just like triggered and my whole body was literally shaking my mind was mm-hmm. racing couldn't figure couldn't connect the dots anyways I went to this workshop um, because I had an interest in Alexi and I had trust issues in my relationship to the point where the relationship was was close. Not, it wasn't at breaking point, but it was gone to breaking point because there were things happening where uh, Cersei was having her boundaries uh, pushed and obviously my mistrust, but I did trust, which in my mind I couldn't, figure out why the fuck this was happening because I did trust her but my body was giving out a different reaction and um, so I went to that workshop and it like fucking blew <laughs> the eyes out of my head it blew the eyebrows off my fucking face it literally blew my heart to one end of Australia to the other like you picture my heart it was everywhere. It was <laughs> every fucking where. So I know you're laughing with nervous excitement. Um, so uh, congratulations. <laughs> congratulations. But what came out of that? So I went from not knowing, look, I knew there was more for me, but I didn't yeah. know what it was. Uh-huh. Um, so I've got two questions here. Like the moment I was there and I could see this is like this is what can be achieved in two days and 48 hours. Like why are my people suffering in silence? Why are my friends committing suicide and, and mm. all of those things? And and I was like, 
why does the world not have these tools? Like, like what? I couldn't comprehend what had just happened, the transformations mm-hmm. that everybody had had, but then mm-hmm. my own transformation. So I was living proof of these tools actually working. Um, and then the penny drop, you have to deliver it. Who, mm-hmm. who better to deliver it to your people than you? Like, mm-hmm. cause I come from, like, it's a war zone in its own way, you know? Um, and my question, like, I knew then, like, I fucking knew I have to do this. And I, oh, my, my, I was like, I want to. It's not, I have to. It all came wrapped in that fucking ball of fire. Like, you have to share this with the world. Like, and I want to as well. So mm-hmm. um, my two questions come back to you. One, yours. And um, what would you say? Like, I think you've already answered that question. What would you say to somebody who who already knows that that's their love, but they're mm-hmm. choosing to do something, give away their time for money? Um, I, th- I think you've already answered that question. But for somebody like me who didn't know, but they know that there's something else. Mm-hmm. So I'm giving away my time for money. I love plumbing, so I won't bad now that. But the construction industry is uh, hugely toxic. You've got wounded men and adults' bodies. So mm-hmm. for, for you, that question, what would you, how would you answer that question? Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you for asking, Darren. I'm going to start with the first one, uh-huh. um, which is, you know, if someone knows what it is that they want to do, but they're doing something else, how do they start to navigate that? Right, because uh-huh. this is my story, so I've got personal experience with that. Um, one of the things that I think was really important for me to do, Dara, is um, I kind of have this thing where I kept a foot in both camps. Uh-huh. Right? So I didn't just quit my job and go, great, I'm going to throw myself completely into psychology and that's the only thing I'm going to do and that's my vision and I'm just all, all guns blazing towards that. That wasn't me. I dipped a toe in slowly and I was like, look, I'm pretty sure I want to do psychology. Let me just start by doing one year mm-hmm. and then seeing whether I enjoy it. And I did. So I continued, right? So if people can start to dip their toes into the area that they love in any way that they can, amazing, right? Like if you really love music and you're working in a corporate job, join a band, mm-hmm. right? And do, do start to play um, free gigs in your spare time. I'm giving that as sort of a bit of a silly example, but, you know, really encourage this idea of how can you just start to include more of that in your life so that you're taking steps towards that vision without necessarily quitting your old life, cut, cutting back yeah. and stepping into the new thing without any um, experience or any guarantee. There's no guarantee in life, right? But um, that was my approach. Now, yeah. there may be people out there who are like, you know what, I'm ready to say goodbye to my old life and I just want to jump into the new life. Amazing. Yes. Or hats off to you. Go for that it. was the approach that I took. And I, I, I admire that as well because that was the from the moment I said I was going to deliver this work to my neighbourhood. Um, it took me three years to completely transition. Um, it took me twelve months before I even owned what I was capable of doing and what I was after, like learning, and um, yeah. like publicly. Um, and then from then, because I, I the security of regular wages. Yeah. And um, I, I feared letting that go. And obviously the financial rewards of being a plumber in Sydney. Um, yeah, so it took me three years. I, I, I played both worlds for three years yeah. before. Yeah, before. absolutely. Yeah. And especially, you know, for people who do have mortgages and kids, Dara, you know, sometimes um, you do need to do that, right? Because there are practical realities of living in a body on earth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we need money yeah. <laughs> and as, as awesome as manifesting is that also takes concerted effort right that's i think that's one thing the secret was probably missing this idea that you need I to just... take action uh... sitting on your meditation pushing visualizing what it is that you want without doing anything to walk towards that vision isn't really going to get you where you Please. want to be <laughs> i heard a great analogy on uh, i don't know if you know the diary of a ceo Stephen. Yeah. Um, it's a podcast, it's huge. Uh-huh. Anyways, uh-huh. Uh, manifesting without taking action is like getting into the car, typing in the sat navigation where you want to go and not putting your foot on the gas. <laughs> That's so true. I love that. That's exactly it, right? You haven't even taken the initiative to turn on the car. 
Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. So yes, I, I love that. So that was that was my path, sort of dipping my toe in and slowly, very slowly transitioning and at each point checking in like, how does this feel? Does this mm-hmm. still feel like I want to move towards that a little bit deeper and a little bit further? And the answer was always yes for me. So I did. Amazing, amazing. Yeah. And the second question, somebody who knows this more, but they don't know what it is. Yes. Do you know, I wonder if there's a similar answer to that. Now, I don't have a lot of experience with this, Dara, but the two things that when I wanted to transition out of IT, the two things that I really loved doing was psychology and I wanted to be a fashion designer. Mm -hmm. Now, I wanted to be a fashion designer since I was very, very young. Uh So that's one thing that I knew was being consistent for me all along. The reality of that was quite different. So what I did was I started to speak to people in both fields and while I was doing psychology, I was also doing some design courses on the side mm-hmm. to see what would feel better for me and what options might be open in my future. Um, and I was lucky enough to know a couple of people in the fashion design industry at that time, um, as well as psychologists. And after speaking with them, I think they just liked the lives that the psychologists were leading. Mm-hmm. Right, that that I felt like they were more fulfilled. Um, overall, you know, their mm-hmm. sense of contribution was quite high, and so I really took that on board. And for me, <laughs> go ahead. Um, you know, it, it was really helpful to speak to people who were a couple of steps ahead of me to find out what it's like, because then I could picture myself there and kind of go, okay. I love the creativity about fashion design, but I don't love how the industries are working and I don't love the hours and I don't love blah, 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 right? What I do love is I love the psychology thing and I love all the options and I love all the different pathways. So I went down that pathway but still maintained some of the creativity around fashion design. So I love clothes. Um, I'm still into art. Um, so that's still a part of my life. It's like I haven't necessarily let that go, but what I have let go of is the dream of working in that industry on a professional level. And I'm okay with that simply because mm. I'm so content where I am. Yes, amazing. Such a great answer. I want to highlight two huge points that you just made there. Um, one, feeling. So, so trying these new things out and going off mm-hmm. your intuition of how it feels for you. So for all of the listeners, um, navigate your life through feeling as opposed to thought. If yeah. it feels good and, and, and expansive and you enjoy doing what you're doing or, or what you're trying to do as a, as a new career or the thing that you love, see how it feels for you before you either cut the cord. And that's across the board with everything. And, yeah. and secondly, what you mentioned, see, see, see how it feels for you first. And um, secondly, you mentioned you spoke to people in either industries first yeah. to see what their life experience was like um, and the quality of their lives. I've obviously got a bunch of people in each world. Um, the fashion industry chews up people. It, yes. it chews up people. It's time consuming and yeah. it's uh, it's driven. What, what would you say? Uh, results? Not yeah. results. But it's, it's hugely demanding. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and it's just a big, massive corporate machine yeah. um, where where psychology and what you're doing now is, is purpose-led that helps unlock people from the pain of their past. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So what I'm highlighting, sorry to cut you off, what I'm highlighting here is speaking to people who have already walked the path that you want to walk. Mm-hmm. How crucial is that to... Um, the direction you want to go in your life. Yeah, so crucial, Dara, because we can't know what it's going to be like when we get there. We have certain ideas, but those ideas may not necessarily match up with um, the reality of things, right? And I think the other thing that was also really important for me to get clear about is, okay, I sat down and had to think about what are my values like? Why do I want to go in either direction, right? And for me, the fashion design would have been it's fun. You get to travel and you get to create things, right? And for psychology, it was more like um, I get to make a difference and I get to really learn and grow. 
um, and I get to expand not only myself but also my clients, right? Um, and so it's really about, okay, where do you feel like your values are more aligned with who you are? And I decided it was like hold you for me because for me, contribution and service is one of my biggest values, you know, making mm-hmm. a difference in people's lives, using my own experience and my own journey as um, a way to catalyze that for other people was super important. And then I looked at those three things. I was like, okay, can I have fun? Can I have travel and creativity somewhere else in my life? Yeah, I can. And so that met that need. And so what I started to do at one point, I don't do it anymore, but I just started to design my own clothes and just make them and sew them, right? Yes, so I'm like, that really scratches that itch. Wow. Um, so I, I feel like I didn't need to step into that industry because I had those needs met in another way and I could step into the one that was more aligned for my life. Wow. Oh yeah, I just say it as a as a yeoman tool kit, like you know, like a Swiss Army knife type person. <laughs> <laughs> what you see is not you get way more than what you see. You get way more than what you see. Incredible. Um Rebecca, you said something at the start that I want to come back to, um, which is aligned with both of those things. When you spoke about the fit at the war in being in a war zone in Lebanon and how uh, how your mind when fear is so overwhelmed when fear is so overwhelmed the mind doesn't absorb so much mm-hmm. of it yeah. but now you know your body keeps the score yeah can yeah. you elaborate to the listener what that means yeah so it basically means that just because you can't recall something through memory through a visual image or you don't have any words to describe something doesn't mean that the experience hasn't landed with you. Um, And the easiest way that I could describe it, Dara, is um, everyone has experienced the fight or flight, right? Uh When we're feeling really anxious, you know, and what's happening physiologically in the body is we've either got adrenaline or cortisol going from our brain down our spinal cord into our muscles, getting us ready to take some kind of action. Mm -hmm. Um, what often happens in things like um, a war zone or abusive relationships or traumas, if you can't discharge that energy, it stays in your body and it can kind of calcify almost, right? We get tense muscles. It sort of just stays there until it is ready to be discharged. Um so I give you an example, and you know I've had friends who kind of go, uh, "We don't think like that, Rebecca," and that's probably because you grew up in a war zone. Um, <laughs> it's like fireworks, good right? friends, huh? Right? Yeah, fireworks, so so beautiful. I love fireworks, but my immediate response is always like, "Ooh, okay, there's a there's some there's a bomb exploding, right?" It's not a memory that I have, but my body will just startle involuntarily. And then I have to breathe and kind of come back and go, okay, just fireworks, amazing. Let's just really enjoy the show. When I see a helicopter, um, the thought that goes through my mind is, oh, I wonder if they've got missiles that they're going to start throwing. And I know that this is an illogical thought because we're in Australia and it's very safe, but that doesn't stop my mind from immediately, just very briefly, you know, um, whiffing that thought over my consciousness, it's right? Fast, yeah. yeah, and then having <laughs> to remember why. Like, okay, it's fine, it's just a plane. It's probably like, you know, checking for sharks or whatever mm-hmm. it is, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so your body will will remind you of experiences that it's had that you may not recall logically. Mm-hmm. Amazing. And um, Preston sprung to mind as you were answering that. Um, implicit memories and explicit memories yeah. One is uh, outside and the other is inside, inside the body, yeah. that we don't remember psychologically, yeah. through memory. Um, incredible. That's a, a powerful statement. And so for from your world, like uh, I, I came in from coaching, so it's really good that I got to train with you and learn from you because mm-hmm. um, I came in from the body first yeah. as opposed to the mind first. Um, yeah. So before you stepped into the coaching world and uh, elemental coaching and did you do anything before that and did 
did you think of, how will I say, did you think of it like that before you came into coaching or did you already know that from psychology? Mm -hmm. Look, I already knew that from psychology, you know, that mm -hmm. distinction between explicit and implicit memory. And um, they talk a lot about how um, trauma does get stored in the body and some of the ways to resolve it. I think one of the things that my training didn't necessarily um, go into is how do we actually start to discharge that? How do we access those memories? How do we release them from the body? Which I love that element and totally went into that space because mm -hmm. it's so important and I find that with my clients coming at it from a logical perspective where we just talk about it isn't enough, Dara. Like we really need to be in the body and in touch with the emotions, um, having the tools to really allow the emotion space to come up and release and, and um, let go because without that, honestly, you can talk until the cows come home. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot that's going to shift if you're not shifting it physiologically. Mm -hmm. The stuckness will stay there simply because your um, body is holding all of that trauma through its muscles, through um, the adrenaline glands still being, you know, really high through elevated cortisol levels. Like all of that needs to change in order for trauma to be healed and released. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, for me, you know, I knew I, I knew quite a fair bit about the body and how trauma gets stored, but um, Elementum just took it to a completely different level. Like the stuff around um, how your body is in an elevated state, I think even personally I didn't realise how elevated I was, even though I felt quite calm. Right? <laughs> One of those just you. really made me realize, like, <laughs> my goodness, I am so in fight or flight right now. Even though before that, I would have gone, I'm so calm. I'm really chill. I'm actually really cool. And it really just goes to show how many of us can have a calm veneer, but really be boiling underneath. Uh huh. Uh huh. Wow. Yeah. And I got to uh, experience that. Mm. It was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I got to experience plenty of that. <laughs> <laughs> me and Rebecca had uh, one of my favourite moments in the whole program. Look at full love to everyone. You know the way you, you, they say you can't choose who's your favourite child. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm gonna fucking I'm gonna break that rule. I'm gonna say look at that was my favourite group. That was my favourite group. <laughs> me you and Matt. Was great. Oh yeah. fuck, love man, that, that was. Group. I feel like the level of skill set in that group was like, yeah, yeah, that was different. <laughs> so crazy. much learning, so much growing. Yeah, huge, mm -hmm. huge amount. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. because um, it's really interesting because all of my clients, um, like ninety five percent of them, have been to uh, psychologists and counselors and psychotherapists and yeah. doctors and done all of the things and. Yeah. They say, like, the, in, in some of the, the testimonials, they even say, like, the results that I have now are, like, nothing I've had previously, you know, in regards to everything, really, you know. And now with, um, like, somatic energy, it's, it's, that's what it is, releasing, releasing trauma from the body uh, physiologically uh, from a somatic standpoint. Um, do you now... Do you now marry your skill sets with, with the training that you've learned? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Look, I, I definitely do. In some way, I feel like it's just taken it to a deeper level, Dara, because I kind of always, um, I, I love the body and so I always worked with it anyway. Like a lot of my clients will be, they'll know, they're like, yeah, Rebecca's going to get us to do another body-based stuff. Here we go. Like I've got the and the breathing and all of that. But it seems almost as if the knowledge has just clicked at a deeper level. Mm -hmm. um, like, let me just give you an example. I, I've been barely breathing for, for years and years, right, mm -hmm. um, which is amazing, an amazing tool. But one of the things that I decided to do after Elementum and, and realising, like, actually I'm probably more activated than I'm aware is I decided to track my breathing and um, see how often I'm belly breathing. And it's amazing, Dara, how often I'll stop breathing throughout the day or how often I find my breathing up here. 
So just that one little intervention where I'm really trying to do more diaphragmatic breathing and really trying to check in with myself throughout the day several times, like, okay, how am I breathing right now, has been so powerful for me personally. Mm -hmm. And, you know, through Elementum, that now is being passed on to my clients, right? Mm -hmm. The regulation tools were just out of this world. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know if you remember the the somatic sheet that we got the the blue and red one with the 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 grounding and um, all of that. The massage and um, that. Uh, what was it? Caressing, not sexually. What's it called? <laughs> like the well, boundaries and the boundaries um, and uh, self caressing. What's the word? Pleasure, self pleasure. Yes. Yes. Grounding. How to yes. touch yourself. Yes. What areas to touch yourself yes. and to uh, My clients love that stuff. You know, they find it really, really helpful to just have that there and I'll teach them, you know, one or two every session. And it's just so powerful to soothe the nervous system. Mm-hmm. And as I'm kind of realising it's all about the nervous system, mm. it all comes back to the nervous system because when we don't feel mm. safe, it's not out there, uh-huh. right? We're not feeling safe in our body. Uh-huh. Right? Right? And so safety is an inside <clears throat> job. Get your nervous system regulated and you will start to feel safer. Wow, that's incredible. Um, so before before the angle you came from, like did 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 you target the nervous system like that previously with, with your skill set before? Um, only because I had learned that through many of the workshops that I'd done for myself, Dara. So this was outside of my um, immediate training because there's so much in clinical psychology that they don't necessarily spend a lot of time on the nervous system um, uh-huh. and how to downregulate. Really, that was a lot of the stuff that I learned through my own journey that the client yeah. then gets to benefit from. Yes. But I'm certainly taking it to a deeper level. Like there are hardly any sessions now that I have with clients where they won't get at least one nervous system intervention. Yes, that's that's I mean that's the key. That's the yeah. like that's the key to all of it. Yeah. Um like yeah. you can't uh, the analogy as well, what was it? Um if if someone's in fight or flight no matter what way you're trying to coach them or or whatever you call it and, and yeah coach them or, or, or work with them yeah. they yeah. they just see you as a threat. It doesn't matter yeah. how soft how soothing, how calming, whatever it is, if they're in that elevated Hulk brain, yeah. they just see you as a threat. So how how important for people to have down-regulating tools or how important do you feel it is for people to have yeah. down-regulating tools? So important. And not just for adults but for children as well, Dara, because, you know, mm. they really could benefit <clears throat> from some help and some tools as well. And it doesn't take a lot just to refocus on your breathing and make sure that you're breathing down low in your belly right um but it's super super important so important sometimes that i even start off a session like that i say right before we begin we're just doing a couple of breaths so let's close our eyes and let's let's do that just to really help them land in that space because often that had a crazy day right and they're bringing all of that into the session and mm. you know we we get a bit off track and they're feeling really ungrounded so i'll often just begin sessions and go okay Let's just take a couple of breaths and really land in this space, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And and disconnect okay. from the day. Yep, yep. Yes, yep. I love mm-hmm. it. Um, so how how do you now moving forward? Like, what do you feel is best practice to? You know, marry these two worlds together for the obviously for the benefit of people at large and um, humankind. Mm-hmm. Yeah, look, um, I feel like that's sort of something I'm still trying to navigate myself, Dara. But definitely, I think when we try and look at things from a cognitive perspective, we're quite limited. Mm-hmm. We really need to bring the body into it and the emotional body in particular into the sessions and work on all of those elements simultaneously we can't just work in silos anymore i think you know Mm -hmm. um as clinicians particularly right 
we need to start to bring the body into it. Mm-hmm. Um, that's almost the, the new frontier. Uh-huh. Right? Because that, you know, there's a lot of talk in clinical psychology about, okay, you treat depression this way and personality disorders are treated this way and then anxiety is treated this way. And I love the work around the body because it just transcends all of that data, right? It's almost like, okay, we're not working on the diagnosis per se because all of them, no matter what it is that you're going to label people with, it comes down to nervous system dysregulation. Mm -hmm. Whether you're in a hyper state or a hypo state, you're dealing with the same thing. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. And, and and this is the thing as well, like there's a uh, life experience comes into it too, that a book doesn't give you, you know? Yeah. Um, your life experience, like your transition from career when you knew you, you got the tap on the shoulder, you know, there's, a book doesn't give you that wisdom. No. Um, that's, that's lived experience. And there's yeah. something that stuck with me hugely, um, Bodhi was 10 days old and Cersei liked to breastfeed in the bed because, mm-hmm. you know, it's the closeness and it's a newborn and the connection, then she doesn't need to get up and he, he literally has the build on tap. Um, but anyway, so we, I came up and uh, it was like, he was, he was asleep, but when I picked him up, he was like floppy a bit, you know, and he was, he was breathing really fast. He was still a newborn. And, Obviously panicked and we're like, Sir, look at this, what's happening? And I went to bed and he was fine, but she's obviously a, a, a new mother again. And she's like, Woke me up, the ambulance is on the way, uh, we're going to the hospital. So I'm like, All right, all right, too. So we went to the hospital. The next day, the doctors tried to deal, like, they wanted to give them, they done an x ray, and um, it's like, you know, because where in, in this side of life where 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 we agree more with natural remedies and but this is an emergency. So yes, we agreed to the X ray and then they wanted to do a spinal tap. Mm. They wanted to give um twenty one days of antibiotics mm. without even getting the results of the the X ray. Mm. So they know like they they already said his breathing was fine. But the, all of this was precautionary. So then they took Sersha off and what were they doing? They wanted to take loads. And so obviously he's crying because mm. um, his uh, little nervous system is on the barn. And, yeah. But the doctor kept on saying, he'll never remember this. It's okay. Mm. He won't remember this. right? Mm. And then they took Sersha off into a room, told me that, there wasn't enough room for me to go into this room. But when mm-hmm. she got there, there was seven of them. Mm-hmm. Two that brought her in, and then there was five more. And they yeah. started poking them with things. And um, mm-hmm. they wanted to take the urine directly from his anus and extract mm-hmm. it from, um, from the liver. Is it the liver? Mm-hmm. Or the bladder. From the bladder. And then they wanted to do the spinal cap. So... So she's a new mother, we're a newborn, she's vulnerable, she's on edge, her, her nervous system is in hyper uh, state, mm-hmm. she's in fight or flight big time. I'm this separated, they told me there wasn't enough room for me, but they kept telling her, he'll never remember, it'll be mm-hmm. okay. And then in my mind, I'm like, no, this is bullshit. Like, I, I, you're, this is what you're trying that, but this is what I'm trying that. I know yeah. he'll remember it. His, not, not that he will logically, yeah, yeah. psychologically, but his body, the implicit memory will live in his body forever. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so it was just that, like, get me the fuck out of here. That, that's mm-hmm. where we were at then as a family. Mm-hmm. So we didn't allow them to do any of the things. Oh. And we stayed overnight as a precaution. And every check they done, like, just the regular one of the check the heart and the breathing, they all checked out. And he, mm-hmm. even the doctors, like, they actually, uh, you know, gave us a, you know, well done. Like, mm-hmm. you know, we just, and apologised to us, look, we, we, this is sort of what we have to do. Mm-hmm. Um, because that's our training. Yeah. Do you know? So yeah. it's like, there, there also gets to be uh, intuition. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. 21 days of antibiotics on a, on a, 
a, a 10 day old baby. Yeah. But that fucking fucks with your immune system. Yeah. For a, a longer time. So, so what would you say in regards to that, you know, um, for people to trust their, uh, not their immune system, trust their intuition as well as yeah. not blindly going with something because it came from a book? What would you uh, speak about that? Yeah, I love that story, Darren. I love that piece that you are mentioning around intuition because I think that that's so spot on. I think we're endowed with intuition because there isn't a one-size-fits-all. Each and every one of us needs to touch in with that wisdom inside to figure out what is best for us, you know. Um, and I think the one thing that I always try and encourage my clients to think about is just because someone is a professional doesn't mean they know better than you. Your body is so wise. And if your body is telling you something that's going opposite to what I'm saying, I want you to trust yourself. Yeah. Because that mean, that's your path, yeah? And that means that that's right for you, you know? I think that's super important and um, it's so sad that as children we kind of start to get um, socialized out of our intuition because it's so powerful mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so powerful and if we if we had the opportunity to stay connected with it maybe more, more of us would leave would lead lives that were aligned mm-hmm. with our purpose right because then we wouldn't feel this distance we would use that as a guide to show us the next steps and where we needed to go so Trust your intuition as much as you can. Go with it. Rebecca, it fills my absolute fucking every fibre of my being to hear you say that as a clinical psychologist. Um, it just because, like, not you, whatever professional industry tells you to do something, if it doesn't feel good for you, check in with your body. And yeah. it's, it's telling you, it's highlighting that for a reason. I think that's yeah. the simplest way to know what's good for you and what's not. Absolutely, absolutely. Like I'll have clients, we'll, we'll agree on a particular homework and they'll come back and they'll be like, look, it just didn't really resonate with me. Awesome. Thank you for letting me know. Let's mm-hmm. work together to find something that is going to work for mm-hmm. you. Mm-hmm. And it is, it's, it's, it's that, that um, synergistic relationship that I think we're missing from the medical model because we've got this idea that, the professionals have got the power. And I I think of it more as this. Mm-hmm. Right? Well, on an even balance. For anyone who's listening, uh, Rebecca is just showing her hands as uh, <laughs> we're on an even playing field. And I'm glad because this is the same for me because I see the system not as broken. It's the system is doing what it's designed to do. Yeah. But it's also, I don't feel it's, it's doing things to the benefit of our creativity and our own intuition and what's called alternative, which is actually better for you as an individual, as a, as a man or woman on the planet. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's changing slowly, Dara, but I think mm-hmm. that it, it, is, it is slow. Mm-hmm. It's opening up. Rebecca, yeah. thank you very, very, very much. What is in your future real quick? What is in your future? Oh, I don't know, Dara. Um, (laughs) I really love the life coaching thing. So um, really for this year, I'm going to try and transition more strongly into that particular area. So I think that's one of the things I'm going to be working on um, this year. That's my focus. Yeah. I'm going to be serving my psychology clients and wanting to step more into that coaching space. Wow. That's amazing. Um, what needs to happen for you to do that? Like, is yeah, what needs to happen that you step more into it? Um, just do it. <laughs> <That's all. laughs> to use your own analogy, planning history comes very, very handy. So I've got some steps and some ideas and things that, uh, in the pipeline for how that might happen. Um, uh-huh. so it's me just literally doing them. Just- yeah, I, I said, I don't know if you heard me, just do it. Like, use your own <laughs> analogy from yeah. Mike earlier yeah. on in the session. Do you, do you, do you need to uh, relinquish a degree to, to? No, no. Yeah, so um, I'm actually in the process of speaking with lawyers to see what I might need to do about maybe keeping them separate. 
um, or whether there is a possibility to integrate them because, you know, clinical psychology, there are particular um, codes of conduct that I have to adhere to um, yeah, yeah. and a bit more flexibility in life coaching. So um, I'm in the process of sort of seeing how I'm going to be able to navigate all of that. Mm, that's incredible. I've learned mm. so much from this conversation. So thank oh, you. Really. Thank you for <laughs> so that. Welcome, Sarah. <laughs> yes, Sarah. Kinda... It's been an absolute pleasure. Yes, amazing. Um, I'm excited to hear how you get on at the bridge. I almost, um, I wanted to come as a facilitator, but yeah. the wedding is on the same date. Yeah. yeah. So um, they wouldn't let me do one. I needed to do both. So yeah. anyways, Rebecca, at the end of every session, every conversation, I ask a question. Mm-hmm. What does the waves of change mean to you? Hmm. Do you know, Dara, the thing that comes up is being in the flow and not fighting what is and trusting that you are being guided to your next version of yourself. Thank you. Mm. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> you can chat to you for another hour, but I'll give you back your day. Thank oh, you. Much fun, Dara. Very much. That's him. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. If anything resonated for you, please leave a comment below. If there's anyone who may need to hear, please share. I love you. Have a lovely day.